From his earliest days, those who knew Washington saw that he had a sense of purpose and a quality of leadership that set him apart. On June 15th, when Congress needed someone to guide the Federal Reserve Bank, Washington was the unanimous choice. Observe biographer Douglas Freeman, everything about Washington suggested the commander, his height, bearing, flawless proportions, composure, and the ability to create confidence. A month after his nomination, Washington took command of the troops, devoting the next few months training a 14,000-man army of undisciplined provincials. Although many of the military campaigns were conducted by other generals, Washington was responsible for the overall direction of the war. Decisive battles followed one after another. Early in 1776, Thomas Paine, a political writer, published a pamphlet called Common Sense, urging the colonists to separate from the mother country and declare their independence. Paine's words spread like wildfire throughout the colonies, energizing people to take action against their oppressor. When Congress officially adopted the Declaration of Independence at Philadelphia on the 4th of July, Washington rejoiced along with the colonists, assembling his troops, while one of his aides read the declaration in a loud, clear voice so that all could hear. Now he and his army could fight for a country that was free and independent. That summer, while at his headquarters in New York, Washington was the target of a murder plot hatched by Tory sympathizers. One of Washington's trusted lifeguards, Thomas Hickey, arranged for the general's housekeeper to put poison in a plate of green peas, a dish Washington was fond of. Hickey watched the girl at an open door as she carried the poisoned food to the general's table. Unknown to Hickey, the housekeeper had previously revealed the plot to Washington, who made an excuse for sending the peas away. Hickey was arrested, tried by a court-martial, and hanged in a field before 20,000 people. In the waning months of 1776, confronted with a loss of civilian morale and wholesale desertions to his army, Washington decided on a bold move to capture the city of Trenton, New Jersey. Embarking at dark on Christmas night, the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army led 2,400 veterans across the Delaware River in small boats. Despite a storm of wind, hail, rain, and snow, the surprise attack caught the enemy garrison completely off guard, routing the 4,000 Hessian soldiers that held the city. Less than two hours after the first shot was fired, the Germans surrendered and the battle was over. After a series of reverses in the field the following year, Washington decided to the troops at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Soon after, however, the lack of food and medicine cost him the respect of the encampment. On one occasion, Washington noted, for some days past there has been no less than fire in the camp. His soldiers, he decried, are naked and starving. Without sword and blankets to wear out the red and cold of winter, sickness and death spread their contagion through the camp. Exposure and disease. Most historians doubt that Washington ever knelt down in the snow, but an artist scene entitled The Prayer at Valley Forge forever memorialized early America's darkest hour. After ratifying the treaty with France as an ally, Congress ordered Washington to administer an oath of allegiance at Valley Forge. In a ceremony that took place on the 12th of May, the officers placed their hands on the Bible, taking the oath together. Earlier that winter, a turning point in the fortunes of the Continental Army occurred with the arrival of Baron von Steuben, the former aide-de-camp to Frederick the Great of Prussia. A seasoned soldier from the old battlefields of Europe, von Steuben volunteered his services to Washington's Continental Army in what has been described as the most rapid military training in the history of the world. 
the Prussian drillmaster was confronted with a ragtag group of men with little, if any, knowledge of military discipline. A raw militia of all sizes and shapes, strangers to the world of military maneuvers. Standing before the shivering, half-starved provincials, von Steuben was able to transform his recruits into a fighting force to be reckoned with. As the war entered its fifth year, one of Washington's most trusted generals, Benedict Arnold, defected to the British. Fortunately, Arnold's plot to hand over West Point to the enemy was thwarted in time. Of Arnold's betrayal of America, Washington later wrote, There are no terms that can describe the baseness of his heart. In August of 1781, General Charles Cornwallis was ordered to send 3,000 of his troops to New York in the belief that Washington planned to attack the British forces there. Faced with a large loss of troops, Cornwallis felt that his safety lay in securing a good position and making it as strong as possible. He selected a high plain at Yorktown in Virginia for his 7,500 troops and several hundred loyalists. There he erected a fortified camp and threw up military defenses across the York River at Gloucester. After meeting with French commander Rochambeau and leading members of Congress, Washington launched what turned out to be a brilliantly planned campaign against the British. In his diary he wrote, Matters having now come to a crisis, I am obliged to give up all idea of attacking New York and instead to move against Yorktown. Washington himself touched off the Americans' first cannon shot to lead off a large artillery barrage on October 9th. American and French forces in September took up siege positions at Yorktown, surrounding the British forces. The Allied bombardment continued without let-up, battering the British positions with devastating results. The British were overwhelmed in fighting that lasted eight days. On the 17th, Washington rejected the proposal, instead giving Cornwallis a two-hour ceasefire order. Representatives from both sides conferred the following day at the Moore House near Yorktown. There, the terms of surrender were agreed on. At 2 p.m. on the 19th, the surrender took place on a field not far from Washington's quarters. Cornwallis, embarrassed at his defeat, sent his second in command, General Charles O'Hara, to deliver up his sword. Approaching Washington, O'Hara took off his hat, apologizing for the absence of the British commander. Washington greeted O'Hara and referred him to General Lincoln, also his second in command, to receive the sword. To deliver the colors of the British regiments, an officer in the British service was appointed to receive 28 standards from the British captains and hand them to the 28 American sergeants appointed to receive them. Thus did the British surrender at Yorktown mark the end of the Revolutionary War, a long-fought struggle that won independence for the Americans. At Army headquarters in Newburgh, New York in early 1783, impatient at Congress's neglect of their needs, a group of officers supporting General Gates called for a meeting without notifying Washington. Washington was shocked at the unauthorized assembly, but diffused the planned rebellion with a surprise appearance at the meeting. He begged his officers to do nothing to blacken the glory they had won on the field, and to make one more effort to get justice from Congress. When he finally left the meeting, the conspiracy at Newburgh came to an end. Two years later, on September 3, 1783, a peace treaty was signed in Paris marking the official end of hostilities between England and America. At noon on November 23rd at Frances Tavern in New York, the officers of the Continental Army gathered for a final meeting with their commander-in-chief. With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you, said Washington. I cannot come to each of you, but shall be obliged if each of you will come and take me by the hand. Each of the officers clasped hands with their leader and embraced in silence. No words were exchanged. 
Washington left the room and walked to a waiting barge. The Continental Army was history. At a meeting of Congress on December 23rd, with his family watching from the visitor's gallery, George Washington officially resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief after serving in that position for eight years. Retiring to Mount Vernon, Washington looked forward to a life of domestic tranquility and restoring his estate that had been neglected by his absence. Martha was able to settle into a normal home life after her husband's long absence, while George once again was able to enjoy his favorite pursuits, including hunting with his favorite dogs, spending time with his family, and overseeing the operations at Mount Vernon. Always the avid farmer, Washington kept up with the latest agricultural procedures of cultivating and planting the land, taking particular interest in experimenting with seed and livestock. But even as Washington was receiving an outpouring of acclaim for defeating Europe's most powerful army, he would soon face a series of trials in guiding his country that would challenge him as never before.